Hello everyone, hope you all are doing well. So we are back with the summary of chapter number 12 and chapter number 13 of why nations fail. So let's move on to chapter number 12, the vicious circle. In this section, we are going to discuss the extractive institutions established by a colonial power and it has been divided into five sections. You can't take the train to be any more. From Ecomienda to land grab, from slavery to Jim Crow, the iron law of oligarchy, negative feedback and the vicious circles. So the first section is about uh, you can't take the train to go anymore. In this section, the authors have explained the case of Sierra Leone, like British took over the Sierra Leone, but the local leaders rebelled, especially in the south. So to crush the rebellion, the British built a railway through the south so that it can help the Sierra Leone economically. But in the 1960s, Sierra Leone became an independent country. And then there were two main parties. One party was dominated in the south. It was SLPP. And the the other party was dominated in the north its name was APC uh, so the railway was in the south and it helped export chocolate coffee and diamonds but the APC leader whose name was Sieka Stevens he won the power he just dismantled the railway to punish the SLPP party because the railway was in the south and he didn't want his opposite party to get benefit from that railway so we can say that he simply cared more about power than the economy of the country so basically this is how the extractive institutions work and the British colonial mining policies in Sierra Leone and Australia exemplify the dis difference between the extractive and inclusive institutions. For example, in Sierra Leone, the British gave a single company a monopoly over diamond mining and helped it recruit a private army. After independence, Siaka Stevens, who was the leader of the APC party, he transferred this monopoly to the government. So uh, when similarly, when in the Australia, when gold was discovered, the elites wanted to sell control to a monopoly. But instead, the public convinced the government to open mining up to everyone so this is the difference which the inclusive and extractive institutions create in the next section which is uh, from Ecomienda to the land grab in this section the authors have explained in 1993 like Guatemala's president and the key cabinet members were all directly descended from the Spanish in fact from 1531 to the present 22 families have monopolized power in Guatemala in many countries including Guatemala elites build extractive institutions that keeps the themselves in power and keep the country underdeveloped uh, this is the case in Guatemala in Mexico and Peru and there was an ecomanda system in which it just enriched the Spanish elites. So this is how it also happened in other uh, states of the world, for example, in the U.S. South. And uh, this is basically the forced labor system that lasted until 1945. And uh, that is why the Guatemala's elite kept using extractive Spanish colonial institutions for their own benefit. And it kept the country indigenous, uneducated and unrepresented in the government. Next section, which is from slavery to Jim Crow's. In this section, the authors have explained that U.S. South was very similar to Guatemala until the Civil War. Its extractive institution enriched a small amount of elites while giving millions of enslaved people no rights at all. As a result, the South was far poorer, less industrialized, and far less innovative than the North. The Civil War forced the South to change, but, in but instead of building inclusive institutions, it maintained its extractive ones through Jim Crow segregation. So that is why just elites were getting wealthier and the other had no right at all. So this is how the vicious circle worked similar to Guatemala in the US. Then the next section which is the iron law of oligarchy. In this section the author have explained like how uh, the vicious cycle kept on repeating itself. For example, uh, when there is a vicious cycle or extractive institution in a place just for example in Sierra Leone, in Guatemala and the US South, the same vicious cycle kept recreating extractive institution for example as it done in Ethiopia so in sociology we call this the iron law of oligarchy because new leaders promised the radical change then they came with the help of the people they just overthrew the old government and when they are in power they just start ruling exactly like their predecessors so basically this is the iron law of oligarchy and it uh, has been applied to many countries including the countries like Ethiopia, Guatemala, Sierra Leone and US South. So the authors ask why radical change sometimes work for example in the glorious revolution and the French revolution. They say that these kinds of uh, radical change only work when there are inclusive institutions or it leads to the inclusive institutions. Otherwise 
it will not work so the next section which is negative feedback and the vicious circle in this uh, section the author explained that inclusive institution tend to become more inclusive over time that is why it is called a vicious circle because pluralism always checks the abuses of power and create inclusive economic institutions which spread wealth and power more broadly and gave people right and a sense of prosperity but in the same way when there are extractive institution it also tend to become more extractive over time and this is a vicious cycle an extractive political institution always create extractive economic in institutions and it will always enrich the elites and protect their power and it will never give other people a chance to become wealthy or be prosperous so guatemala is a good example of how the vicious cycle can keep the same elite in power for centuries then we can see the us south and the jim crow law which is basically based on the segregation between the black and white just like the black people had no right even to sit with a white male or a white man, like person in us and they can can't even go to a same school so this is how extractive institutions work so this is how the chapter 12 ends now let's move on to our chapter number 13 Chapter number thirteen is named as Why Nations Fail Today. Uh, it has been divided into the sections: How to Win the Lottery in Zimbabwe, A Children's Crusade, Who Is the State, El Coralito, The New Absolutism, King Cotton, Keeping the Playing Field at an Angle, and Why Nations Fail. So now let's move on to our section number one: How to Win the Lottery in Zimbabwe. In this section, the authors have explained how Zimbabwe President Robert Mugabe he just won his country's national lottery in 2000 while he was still a president he arranged a lottery people mm-hmm. like uh, purchased a lottery and then the president of that country won the lottery when uh, even when he was in power this is the evidence of how corrupt and extractive the country became under his rule so wages and st- standard of living has been very bad in zimbabwe since its independence uh, zimbabwe was a british colony until 1965 the president robert mugabe he rewrote the constitution to create a one party regime he just be- make so extractive economic policies he tried to rig the elections many time uh, he just ru- ruined the agriculture industry and created a hyper inflation crisis the rise of mugabe is basically an other example of the iron law of oligarchy he is the kind of a populist leader so the author says that extractive political and economic institutions are always the real reason behind a nation's failure the next section is a children's crusade and this section is based on sierra leone's government there was a militia who tried to overthrow a sierra leone government in 1991 When President Siaka Stevens left the office, his replacement just let the government collapse. So the National Radio Tower fell down, for instance, and the government workers stopped receiving their salaries. The rebels claimed to want peace, stability, and an end to autocracy. But in real reality, these rebels just started killing civilians at random, and they just recruited the children and committed other atrocities. The government did the same. like many failed states sierra leone just fell into a long long civil war and the history clearly shows how extractive institutions create war and cause nations to fail extractive institutions have also led to conflict in numerous other african countries including the case of angola mozambique and sudan etc in the next section which is who is the state the authors have asked if any latin america states have failed as badly as african ones they point out that despite being a democracy colombia has mainly extractive institutions and has long fought wars with armed paramilitary groups one of these groups the right wing auc even work closely with politicians and fixes election in rural areas by threatening the voters and like paramilitaries occupy roughly a third of colombian territory and they have displayed raised million of people and control many local governments across the country so basically the author says that the political institutions of colombia incentivize the leaders to cooperate with paramilitary then threaten the state and they doesn't create public services that support the population they just threaten the voter and just stay in power and then the vicious cycle of extractive institutions and corruption keeps on reiterating the next section which is el coralito in this section the authors have explained like how president carlos menem of argentina he just pegged the value of argentina's peso with the us dollar in 1991 so it led the citizens to put all their savings in dollars 
he then forcibly converted everyone's dollar and suddenly changed the exchange rate to reap the profits so this is how an extractive institutions work that is why argentina's famously complex economy has been declining for decades because of its extractive institutions like from the mid 19th century to 1940 it grew, grew rapidly because of heavy but unsustainable investment in agriculture but for the next several decades we have seen that the country faced political instability and several military dictatorship eventually it fell into the hands of the corrupt party which focused on buying votes and repeatedly violated the property rights while argentina might seem very different from other latin american countries in reality its institutions are very similar they are democratic but they are not pluralistic they are not inclusive they are extremely absolutist and extremely extractive that is why the centuries of extractive institutions have encouraged voters to choose more extreme candidates and given such candidates an incentive to rule for their own benefits as they have been ruling as authoritarians in the next section which is the new absolutism the authors have explained that in 2009 the north korean government reformed its currency and then they strictly limited the amount of old currency that forced the citizens to convert to the new one they intended to destroy the black market and limit the opposition to the regime but they also eliminated the majority of people's saving and the author has also raised a part point that despite the north korean government and the north korean regime is communist but they still love to consume luxury goods in fact the author argued that communist country haven't fulfilled the marx vision karl marx vision of communism of an equal human society at all instead they have prosecuted their opponents murdered the civilians and turned themselves into the new elite that is why extractive political and economic institutions keep them in power in the next section which is the king cotton in this section the authors have explained the case of uh, uzbekistan because uzbekistan gains its independence from the soviet in 1991 and then its government started forcing farmers to grow cotton and also forced them to sell it back to the government so the government also forced the children to plant and harvest the cotton instead of going to school for much of the year that is why the uzbek president islam karimov eliminated this opposition and focused on rigging future elections while the majority of the country was extremely poor the president became incredibly wealthy and many other former uss republics are just as extractive and as repressive like the uzbekistan of today in the next section which is keeping the playing field at an angle the author explained the case of egypt like egypt gradually transformed from a socialist society to a capitalist one in the second half of the 20th century but elites allied with the state controlled virtually all the private businesses and many wealthy businesses leader took jobs in the government and many other convicted the state to protect their companies so this is how the egypt's extractive political institutions have consistently driven its economic institution toward extractive policies and this continued until the arab spring and after the arab spring protest the it ended president mubarak's regime in 2011 in the next section which is why nations fail the author have summarized all the arguments and they say that uh, extractive institutions look different in different countries sometimes the elites belong to one party just like in uzbekistan and sometimes like in colombia the elites consist of many group who fight violently over power sometimes the citizens don't have any property right like in north korea but often they do have like in egypt which switch sides from communism to capitalism during the cold war and some countries are simply less attractive than others for instance the argentina's institutions are much less attractive than sierra leone's even after periods of collapses and civil war the iron law of oligarchy can still hold so the author concluded this chapter by saying that every country with extractive institution today has been stuck in the vicious circle since the 19th century and to fix the failed nation it they require breaking the circle and creating inclusive institution in place of the extracting one this is extremely difficult but it is possible for instance it happened during the glorious revolution so this is how the chapter number 13 and now we will and our video at this point and we'll be back with the summary of chapter number 14 and 15 till then stay tuned